Good morning, everybody. Our agenda is Minnesota Jobs. Today we plan to introduce the most important pro-jobs bill that this legislature could possibly pass. Our bill will place before voters in November a constitutional amendment proposal that will allow Minnesota workers and their families to decide if they would like to change Minnesota law to allow them the freedom to decide whether or not they will join a union. As I mentioned, the positive changes that passage of this bill will bring for Minnesota workers are many. Job creation in states with employee freedom happens at twice the speed that it does in forced unionism states. Multiple studies show that jobs grow at this accelerated speed when employees are given the freedom to decide whether or not they will join a union. We believe that the 175,000 Minnesotans who are out of a job today would be very interested in this opportunity. Employee freedom increases the disposable family income of workers. Researchers have estimated that if Minnesota had adopted this policy for worker freedom 30 years ago, today's working families in our state would be taking home as much as $7,000 or more per family annually. We think that $7,000 per year, every year, that future Minnesota families would like to use to pay off their mortgages to put their kids through college or to invest for retirement. There are reasons that many of today's new and expanding job creators are not locating in Minnesota. Boeing recently landed its manufacturing facility for its Dreamliner aircraft and the accompanying 5,000 jobs in Charleston, South Carolina rather than the state of Washington. We know that the Northwest Delta merger chose Georgia over Minnesota, both benefiting states our right to work or employee freedom states. We hear the constant drumbeat of radio commercials from our neighbors in South Dakota, an employee freedom state, asking Minnesota businesses to move there. The migration of capital towards states with employee freedom is cited as one of the primary factors that determine the higher levels of economic growth we regularly see in states that have policies ensuring employee freedom. Brian Bosma, the Republican leader in the Indiana House of Representatives, recently said when discussing their right to work bill that, quote, local economic development officers testis testified that 25 to 50 percent of companies looking to create employment, whether through expansion or locating a new facility, just took Indiana and other non right to work states off the table, end quote. If up to half of the prospective job creators are not going to consider us, it might be time to admit that we have a job creation impediment. The U.S. Census shows that from 2000 to 2009, almost 5,000 people migrated from forced unionism states to right-to-work states. We need to reverse the loss of financial and human capital for Minnesota. This initiative will give Minnesotans the opportunity to reverse the hinges on the doors so that the path to jobs leads into Minnesota rather than away from our state. The economic evidence is clear. Freedom of employment in the marketplace will inspire a renaissance of job creation in Minnesota. It is time for us as leaders to offer the people of Minnesota the opportunity to lift the antiquated barriers to employee freedom that stifle the economy and hurt job growth in our state. Just yesterday, Governor Mitch Daniels signed a bill into law to make Indiana our country's 23rd state to ensure that workers enjoy the freedom of association in the workplace. We're here today to make an appeal to Minnesotans to help Minnesota become the 24th state to extend workplace freedom to its employees. At this time, uh, Senator Thompson will introduce the details of the bill and discuss what the bill does and what the bill does not do. Good morning. Nice to see all of you here today. I think it's a good day for Minnesota. I'd like to thank my colleagues for having the courage of their convictions to be up here. And I know many would like to be here that have other commitments. It's a great day to be in front of you. You know, not too many weeks ago, I got to see the Iron Lady, the uh, Margaret Thatcher story. And she is one of my favorite figures in the, in the history of, uh, of Europe. And uh, she, is quoted, or have a, she has been quoted as saying, there can be no liberty if there is not economic liberty. 
And I believe that nothing can be more at the heart of economic liberty than the ability to take a job to feed yourself and your family without having to pay the piper, without having to pay a third party, and that's what this is about. Uh, let's start with uh, what will be on the ballot, assuming that this legislation passes both the House and the Senate. It will be this simple question, quote, Shall the Minnesota Constitution be amended to guarantee all citizens the individual freedom to decide to join or not join a labor union and to pay or not to pay dues to a labor union, unquote. It's that simple. But let's talk a little bit about uh, what the bill would do, uh, how, how the uh, outcome of the legislation would be, assuming that this passes in November. First off, it is a two-lane highway to freedom. It not only allows people the option not to join a union or pay union dues, but it also protects workers who choose to be a part of a union from discrimination. And in fact, uh, specifically says that uh, no person shall be required as a condition of obtaining or continuing public sector or private sector employment to resign or refrain from membership in, in a union type organization. So folks who want to be part of a union are fully protected. But the real issue is as a as a sense of our core liberty and freedom in this country and in this state should somebody have to pay dues to a third party in order to have a job we believe they should not and that's what this addresses now uh, we're not naive about this we understand that it's a volatile issue and that people care greatly about it so I think this is important to discuss what this legislation doesn't do as it is to discuss what it does do this in no way changes collective bargaining in Minnesota and obviously there have been uh, uh, pieces of legislation and things in other states where that has been an issue this amendment if passed and the accompanying legislation would have zero impact on collective bargaining that would continue in this state as it always has this would not in any way hamper or impede the ability of unions to organize. In fact, there's actually protection for people who choose to be a part of a union. Uh, they would be able to organize. They would be able to set their dues. They would be able to collect their dues, recruit membership, as they always have. Those employees who choose to be a part of a union would be free to do so and, in fact, would be protected by this law. The only change made, should this become a uh, law in the state of Minnesota, pursuant to the constitutional amendment, the only thing that changes is nobody can be forced to join a union. It is simply a matter of free choice. And it's really uh, no more complicated than that. Uh, and and uh, with that, we would uh, ha be happy to stand for some questions. Can you explain the, you, you say the amendment is simple, and it is, but there's, there's all this that goes into law if the amendment passes. Can you tell us what this does? Well, basically what it does and I you know I can't really go through it line by line here in a press conference but the the essence of it is that you simply cannot be forced to join a union in order to work whether or not uh, there's a collective bargaining agreement in place within the workplace and also you cannot be discriminated against should you choose to become a member of a union become a part of a union and obviously because lawyers run the world it has to be rather lengthy and detailed to describe that but that is the essence of it Yes, Senator, um, in a split shop where you, let's say you have a union collective bargaining uh, organization and non-union employees, if the collective bargaining group uh, wins, uh, uh, negotiates a certain contract uh, with certain wage guarantees and benefits, would the non-union employees then uh, pick up those same benefits and and wages how does that work in a split shop that would be up to the employer it would not necessarily be the case the employer would have the option to allow uh, individuals who haven't joined the union to, to um, get the same salary and benefits provided under the collective bargaining agreement, but they would not be forced to do so. If someone chooses not to be a part of the union and wanted to cut their own deal with the employer, they would have the opportunity to do that. Senator, the unions call this bill not right to work. They call it right to work for less. Uh, they say that the Kaiser Family <laughs> Foundation studies and others show that, that uh, right to work states, the employees earn $5,000 less per year, not more. Uh, why do we have these uh, dueling numbers? And do you well, I'm going to let Representative Graskowski address that issue. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, the numbers they use basically compare the, uh, uh, the, the long-standing numbers or the, the current numbers of uh, right-to-work states that many of them uh, were lower wages to begin with. 
and we and many of the uh, the uh, forced unionization states were higher wages to begin with. But what we see here, Pat, is growth in wages is much higher in right to work states than in non right to work states, and that's what we're talking about. We're starting about we're talking about we're starting from here. And what rate of growth are we going to go from where we are today? So we're not talking about earning more money. We're talking about a greater increase in money. We're, we're talking about increases in the uh, wages paid to employees over time. Uh, I don't know if you remember the study from last week, uh, the Center for the American Experiment, uh, and I, I quoted some of those numbers. But uh, it's, uh, it's very clear and very compelling uh, that this, uh, from the point that a state adopts uh, freedom of employment, forward, that state will grow in disposable income to those workers at a faster rate than one that does not. What is the percentage of union membership here in Minnesota? It's my understanding it's low. Why is this a problem? Yeah, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember, union membership in Minnesota I think uh, is about 16 uh, percent. The private unionization uh, percentage is about 9 or 8 percent. Uh, the public sector, I think, is 54 percent to form that uh, that average of 16. So why is this a problem if it's uh, 12 percent or 15 percent or 16 percent? Well, I don't know that we need to look at at those numbers. What we need to look at, Pat, is what happens in right-to-work states. And I mentioned the infusion of capital, both both uh, uh, financial and human capital, that come into the states because of the dynamics that job creators see, and the the ensuing growth that happens in those states, uh, both economic growth and job growth is just very dramatic. And you saw that in the, in the study that came back last week. Uh, we see that in studies repeatedly, and it's, uh, it's very compelling and something that certainly that uh, we would like to see happen in this state. Democratic lawmakers have made clear that the votes for this aren't coming from their side. Do you guys have unified support within your caucuses? I mean, this, you've mentioned yourself that this is a volatile issue. This could... Well, obviously, I can't uh, speak to the House caucus. I can speak to the Senate, and that is uh, I have not uh, quit the issue. I don't have a head count, but I can tell you there are a lot of people that feel very strongly about this issue. And, and but, but, you know, ultimately, um, I'm not here today, and I'm not here in general, to do those things that I think are, are politically expedient or can get done. I'm here to do those things that I believe are right for the citizens of the state of Minnesota, and I think that when the people speak and ask for it, uh, and this uh, this issue is one of those things that people are very favorable to, I think people tend to get the government they want. And so I think that uh, uh, as the support uh, continues to build and people become more vocal, um, I, I think that the issue will take care of itself. As far as a head count, I don't have it, but I know in the Senate there's a lot of support for this issue. Why not pass it as a bill like they did in Indiana? Why put it in the Constitution? Can, can I respond uh, to, to the other question first, and then we can go to that one? Um, uh, we, we have a lot of excitement and support for this measure in the House, uh, and uh, I think you'll end up seeing uh, probably close to a quarter of the House Republican Caucus signed on the bill just to begin with. Um, that is consistent with what we are seeing in the polls that are happening both statewide and nationally. Um, there was a, a poll conducted back in uh, December in Minnesota, actually November, uh, that showed that uh, 73 percent of Minnesotans would like the ability to decide for themselves, the freedom to decide whether or not they want to join a union or pay dues. 73 percent of Minnesotans support that. 69 percent of union workers would like the ability in Minnesota to decide whether or not they want to join a union. That inspires our membership in the House to work towards the freedom for employees in this state. Why, why as a bill and not as a why not as a bill and as a constitutional amendment? Well, um, I think the reason for me is a philosophical one, and that is that I believe a uh, constitution really ought to do two fundamental things. One, provide for the basic structure of government, and two, provide for fundamental liberties. And again, I come back to this idea that there is nothing more fundamental to my economic liberty than the ability to obtain employment and feed myself and my family without having to pay another organization to do it. And it just seems to me that this is something that is reasonable to allow the people of Minnesota at large to decide. What about the issue when it comes to uh, constitutional amendments as a whole? How many 
do you hope to have on the ballot as a GOP caucus? And how much of this is a direct result of having a Democratic governor and not being able to get legislation through him? Well, I can't speak for other people, but I can tell you for me it has nothing to do with having a Democratic governor. I have voiced some concerns about overdoing constitutional amendments, but I think we have to look at are we putting amendments on the ballot that deal with core fundamental issues? And in terms of the numbers, um, since 1972, so that's approximately 20 elections, we have had 31 measures on the ballot. So that is an average of about 1.5 per election. And in fact, in 1980, there were five. So there, there seems to be kind of this storyline developing that we're going crazy with the constitutional amendments, but nothing that we're doing is unprecedented. And I would point out that as of this moment, there is only one that has been approved and only two that have been submitted and talked about. And I don't think it, in any way is it inconsistent with what has gone on for the last 40 years. And I would point out that... Um, during that entire time, the, the Senate was controlled by the Democrats, so that, that rate uh, was something that was approved by the Democrats, and the most recent constitutional amendment permanently ensconced in the Constitution taxation, which me, to me clearly should be the responsibility of a legislature to have to pass and face the electorate. So, How many total do you think, if you could ballpark it right now? 63? Oh, no. Uh, uh, just kidding. Uh, I jokingly said to a paper the other day, I think the over is about three and a half, and I, I can't believe we're going to have more than four. Uh, I re but that's my opinion. That's nothing I've heard from leadership or, or the caucus at large. I don't see any comments on it. Yeah, Jeff, we haven't really had that full discussion in the House either. Uh, the we're at the point in the session where proposals are coming forward, and you're seeing which is a, a proposal which has a great deal of energy in the House as it does in Minnesota, and uh, we are, are looking to act and, and provide Minnesota voters the ability to decide. Passes hot button issues like gay marriage that tends to draw a lot of political dollars in states where it's mounted. Having already put gay marriage on the ballot, are you concerned that um, you're approaching a point of diminishing returns in terms of the political money that will flow elsewhere and therefore not to your caucuses and campaigns? Well, I, I think Dave said it well. We're not uh, focusing on those extraneous uh, uh, elements that uh, the media and others might want to bring up. We're focusing on what Minnesotans are telling us. And they are telling us, I, I've been to a bunch of Reform 2.0 meetings. We've collected this input from people across Minnesota over the last five or six months. Every one of those meetings, um, employee freedom, right to work uh, idea was brought forward, and they they insisted that we put that on the chart as we charted those those ideas going forward. To existing union shop agreements, if this passes, then all this language becomes law. Well, my understanding is that employees uh, that are part of those shops would then have the opportunity to uh, to not work for that or not pay dues to that union anymore if they wanted. So that agreement is void. I don't know about that. Um, I don't know uh, if, if specifically that you know that day they'd have to cut it off or it would be at the at the end of the the agreement that they were currently working under. I, you know, I suppose it, 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 that's a matter of a few months, uh, but uh, eventually they wouldn't have to be. But but one other thing I'd point out too is y you can't assume that in right-to-work states that unions can't be effective and keep large membership. In fact, Representative Graskowski uh, has an article here on many of you have heard about the sugar growers dispute up in the Red River Valley that impacts both uh, the Minnesota side as well as the North Dakota side of the river. And uh, interestingly enough, the article that uh, Representative Graskowski has here and can quote states that in North Dakota, which is an employee freedom state, that nearly 100 percent of those uh, workers belong to the sugar uh, uh, pr uh, processors union or, or whatever the name of it is. That's the work that they do. And so it, it like any other organization. If the union is accountable to its customers, which, of course, would be the union members that they are are uh, there to serve those folks are going to pay for the service and benefit from it, and, and that's one living, breathing example of it. With, with Indiana, there are now 23 states with this type of, of system. Is this proposal that you have patterned after any one state? I mean, do you have, did you get lift language from any, any place in particular? 
Oh, we, we didn't lift language from any place particular, but we looked at a, a bunch of ideas uh, from around the country. Uh, there are a number of states that uh, have employee fr freedom written into their constitution. Some have it statutorily. Um, but uh, as we looked around the country, uh, this, was the, uh, this was the language that came forward and uh, seems to work well. It closely reflects which state or states. Um, it's it's really uh, really the um, culmination of some research on, on on what is working best. Looked at some of the uh, legal challenges that have happened in other states following the impl implementation of right to work or employee freedom there, and best positions Minnesota in this amendment to be successful going forward. So it's, you don't know, or you're not saying which state. It's not a particular state. Where do the bills go, and when will they be heard? <clears throat> do you know yet? Go ahead. On the uh, Senate side, my understanding is that uh, the committee would originally would be the original committee would be the Jobs Committee. Senator Jeff Michelle, of course, is the chair of that, and then like all constitutional amendments, it would go to the Rules Committee. And my understanding is that is the only other stop it would need to make before going to the floor of the Senate. I can't speak for the House. In the House, it uh, will likely start off in the Commerce Committee, and uh, I haven't I'm not really certain of the path from that point forward. Why should union members not consider this an attack on unions? Um, why should they not think this weakens unions? Why should they not think that this is, why should they think this is something that's good for them? Well, I would offer a question, Pat. Why would anybody believe that uh, being forced to do anything is in the best interest of the people who are their membership? And, uh, and that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the freedom to choose, uh, the freedom of association in the marketplace. And as was mentioned earlier, in states that have an adopted employee freedom, what we see is, is the union organizations working harder to instill value in the product that they deliver to their members because the marketplace provides that they have to do do that, and when they do that, uh, their members are more successful, uh, and the out the outcome is uh, is much better. Does not weaken unions if it's passed here in Minnesota. Uh, I don't I don't really have a comment on what it will do to to unions. We're we're really focusing on what it'll do for the workers and what it'll do for the economy in the state. And I think we've reviewed that uh, quite a bit. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.